So I hope everyone has had a great PBIS leadership forum and you have some ideas on what to do to go forward. I hope this year hasn't been, well, why am I saying too challenging for you? It's challenging for everyone. So I might as well not even um, hope that it's not too challenging. It's just been a tough year. Okay, we have a lot. We're supposed to give you about five minutes, but we're going to um, be rebellious and not do that because we have a lot of information. And so we'd like to get through um, the majority of it, hopefully in time so you can ask questions. So today we're going to talk about supporting students with internalizing behavior at three, tier three. And we're going to start talking about taking a function-based approach to addressing students with internalizing behavior. So you have me from the University of South Florida. I'm Rose. And then we have Kathleen Strickland-Cohen, who's from the University of Oregon. I'm sure you know her well. And let me see if my mouse click will work. Okay, I'm assuming this is not your first rodeo, right? So can I'm going to skip these slides. Um, if, if any of these, this is your first rodeo, your first session, and you don't, you really want somebody to help you with these, um, Brian will help. <laughs> yes, we have to have, we, we think we, we need to start going. So you do, this is probably the important thing. If you need support, you can do the help desk. And today's presentation, we have a lot of objectives for just a short amount of time. We're gonna talk about internalizing behavior. First of all, what is it and what's the prevalence? And we're gonna really focus on two primary ones, anxiety and um, school refusal behaviors, which can be a manifestation of anxiety often, particularly with COVID and the continued um, impact of the pandemic. Then we're gonna talk about, and Kathleen's gonna talk about how to functionally approach internalizing behaviors and adapt the FBA to more effectively identify internalizing challenges. And then we're gonna show you some strategies to, that are commonly used. And we're gonna show you some case examples of those strategies um, through, through a case presentation. Um, we're also gonna do the same for school refusal behaviors. So I have a poll and I hope um, you all have figured out how Pathable works. Um, I can't see Pathable when I'm sharing my screen. So I'm relying on my colleagues here to help me. I set up some polls, so I do know how to do that in Pathable. Um, there's a one poll that just asks you, I think, to say what your role is or in with schools or districts. So if you can find that poll and go to it and answer it, I'm going to give you about 10 seconds. And then... Um, and I think it's open-ended, so you just put in whatever your title is. And hopefully Brian will be able to see, and he is going to tell me uh, what, you're, what, what we seem to be getting. And I don't know, Brian, if you can see it or not. I am looking at it right now, yes. Yeah. So we're looking at, uh, we have behavior specialists, school psychologists, uh, school social workers, BCBAs. Um, and then a few assistant principals, instructional assistant, we have an MTSS coordinator, a K-5 special education teacher, a resource teacher, and a coach. Wow, we have a little bit of everything, but we have the right people. That's the important thing. Wonderful. Okay, now I have an actual poll that's really easy. Just go one to five. What, how would you rate your understanding of FBA BIP? If you can go to that poll, that's the next one, and just vote. Okay, so Rose, I'm not seeing the results on that one just yet. Okay. And if we don't. So looking like right now, the results are coming in. We're looking at about, if we group the four average and the five high, we're looking at about over 62%. Yay. So we're not speaking to beginners. We like that. Okay, why don't we go ahead then and do the third poll, third thing. Um, your level of understanding of internalizing behavior from a one to five, and it's kind of the same, just vote. Okay, so just waiting for a few more results to come in here, but it looks like, give it a couple more minutes. Mm -hmm. Seems to have stopped now. Here we go. So about 71% of folks are saying a four or a five. Wonderful. 
Okay, excellent. And if you don't need uh, some of you who rated yourself slower, I bet you're underestimating yourselves, but we hopefully you will you can put questions in the Q&A chat for us and we'll, we're going to try to leave sufficient time for questions at the end. Um, so let's start off with talking about what we mean when we say internalizing. Um, Internalizing behaviors, I like to think of it as, you know, it's so easy to see externalizing behavior because um, those are behaviors that seem to be acting outwardly upon the, something in the environment. So it's real easy to see. But internalizing behaviors are kind of like, it's almost like a, the word internalizing kind of describes it or defines it. It is really focusing your behaviors inward, although the manifestation of some behaviors that are internalizing or um, as a result of factors for internalizing behaviors can become externalizing. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but there's four main internalizing behaviors into broad categories, um, anxiety, depression, social withdrawal, and somatic complaints. Often we think of internalizing behaviors of what they're not. Um, so people who don't, don't wanna come to an event or wanna leave an event could be an, a behavior, especially depending on the pattern. If this continues and it becomes impactful on their life, this becomes something that we may need to pay attention to. Not participating in activities, poor completion of work, frequent trip, trips to school nurse, some of the social um, avoidance, limited interaction with others and school refusals. We also wanna make sure that we understand that sometimes our kids who have internalizing and anxiety, um, which we're focusing on today, can be a result of perfectionism and overperforming. We have some students who really are anxious and wanna do their best with academics. And that can be that perfectionism can end up being a coping mechanism to soothe that anxiety, the feelings that they have, and they're worrying about how well they're doing and how they compare to others. And that really comes, um, that's a big thing with adolescents, but it's becoming more and more apparent in younger children as well. The thing is about overperforming students, one of the reasons we wanted to point this out is sometimes they get overlooked as having anxiety um, and don't be, they, they don't get the supports that they need. So one of the things we want to talk about is the prevalence of this in school. It is really more often than we, we realize. Um, so mental health, basically, and all, suicide is still is the second leading cause now of death among 10 to 34-year-olds. And I think that's astonishing. Second leading cause of death, um, which is, to me, very avoidable. Um, however, it just seems to be increasing. Um, and I know that a lot of what's happened the last year could definitely be impacting that as well. Depressive disorders are the most um, prevalent disorder among suicide victims, especially adolescent suicide victims. Anxiety also is one of the most common mental health disorders. In 2010, uh, it was estimated 25% of 13 to 18 year olds have an anxiety disorder. So I'm thinking of, if you look at your classroom of 20 kids, if you were lucky enough to have only 20 kids, at least two of those kids, possibly three in some cases, because it's hard to do half of a kid person here, are going to have anxiety in any teacher's classroom. There's a great need because what's happening is, as we know, mental health supports are not provided at the level that they're needed. For and, um, and all the internalizing disorders, treatment is less likely to be delivered than if it was an externalizing. So for example, 30% of people with anxiety report getting supports versus 70% of people with ADHD. ADHD, as we all know, the behaviors that are manifested by people with ADHD are very externalizing. They're very recognized. And so they get the support. But anxiety, again, goes underreported, underidentified, and they don't get the supports that they need. Um, there's a recent survey in which 67% of people who have um, internalizing mental health, depressive or other mental health supports, they reported they don't receive the needed supports. And we are seeing more students with internalizing challenges. Um, there's a lot of factors that are, go into it. Um, for example, we're seeing um, 
with the inflation and with things going on and more poverty, there's poor physical health. People aren't going to the doctors as needed. There's family dysfunction, marital discord, sometimes abuse and neglect that seems to be increasing. School failure, school is a big stressor. Um, sometimes parents um, aren't quite sure how to deal with internalizing problems or to how to deal with um, children and, and the supports that they need. Cores of discipline, whether at home or at school, and effect of parenting, social rejection or isolation from peers. And that lacks of adult mentors. And often children who have anxiety or depression, you will find that somebody in their family also may have a mental health disorder. So there's another poll now, a quick poll because I like to get some interaction so you're not just listening to me on Zoom. What risk factors do you see of those risk factors that we listed impacting your students? And I have a list so you can just vote. And I think you can vote for more than one. I think, if not, just vote for the top one. All right, so starting to get some responses in here. Let's see. Um, there's a response here that we're seeing many more internalizing behaviors since COVID, um, passive refusal. Okay, and some people may have gone into um, the risk factors impacting the next poll, which is okay. Because the next poll was, how are they impacting schools yep. and students? That's okay. Let's give you uh, some information then about the other ones. Pretty much across the board, there's all kinds of different um, variables that were listed here. It doesn't seem like there are any real top ones, but the ones that okay. certainly stand out, family dysfunction, poverty, mm -hmm. right. uh, ineffective parenting, parental, family, mental illness. Um, yeah, school failure and social rejection. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for participating. It always helps us as presenters when we have people um, presenting. So now we're going to talk about why should schools even address students' health, health needs? We know that social emotional wellness is correlated with academic outcomes and social outcomes. Children do spend most of their waking hours in school. So that removes the treatment barriers because we do have some families. I'm not about you, but my mother, um, because from another generation, you don't, and she's also Italian, you don't go outside to get treatment. That's done when the family, you know, nobody needs to know anything about your mental health or those kind of things. But the, so other families may not be Italian, but they also have this kind of um, negative connotation put to treatment or receiving treatment for mental health. However, when they're already at school, that removes any treatment barrier, as well as transportation to get somewhere, because sometimes there's no um, way to get the parent to get the child to get treatment. Or if you're in a rural location, there are very few resources. And so if the resources are at the school where the student is, that removes another barrier. Students come and arrive with us with their anxiety. You can't separate that anxiety and say, leave that at home and just come to school without it or your uh, or any other mental health concerns. And often school events trigger anxiety. So it makes sense to do it within the context in which sometimes that anxiety can be provoked. And there's also peer support readily available in schools. And often peer support can be a way of treatment for a lot of these um, conditions. Talked about COVID-19, and uh, we do know that I just got this the other day that there was a study through America's Promising Alliance. So this is last year when everybody was still mainly on high, um, either hybrid or virtual instruction. So they haven't updated recently, but they did a survey of 3,300 high school students in the United States. 33% reported feelings of depression and anxiety since school closing. Um, and this and Browning and all also looked at the data and said students who are women or Asian or low SES seems to be the ones that are most affected. So we want to try to be thinking about um, looking at different factors and the equity um, components to be able to figure out to match the interventions um, and think of the cultural context. So I just did a brief overview. 
Kathleen is now going to talk about function-based approach, and then I'm going to come back in with some cognitive behavior therapy interventions and some case study examples. So Kathleen, it's you. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Um, yeah, so we are, of course, um, talking about tier three supports today as part of, of our talk focused on internalizing challenges. And so we do want to think about and talk about this function-based approach to internalizing behavior. So when we're understanding the function of behavior, obviously we want to understand what is the student communicating to us through their behavior or what is their behavior telling us? So just as with internalizing challenges, um, interventions that are, are focused on addressing internalizing challenges also need to be based on defining behavioral function and thinking through how is this um, internalizing issue or behavior affecting not only what's going on privately, but oftentimes again at tier three, as Rose said earlier, how is it also uh, manifesting as, as externalizing challenges? And, and I think that by using functional behavioral assessment, we can also determine for some of our students who are engaging in externalizing behavior, is that in fact linked to internalizing challenges that we are not thinking about or taking into account? So we wanna talk through how functional behavioral assessment can help us to do that. So part of doing that um, is going to be, can you, I'm sorry, Rose, can you back up one? <laughs> I told talk, her I have a trigger <laughs> finger. <laughs> That's fine. So when we're talking about FBA as it relates to functional behavioral assessment, um, I'm sorry, as it, as it relates to internalizing challenges, um, oftentimes that's going to, it's going to change slightly the way we think about defining behavior, understanding the context, because some of that context, again, is private, and then also identifying the events that predictably follow the behavior. Thank you, Rose, you can switch now. <laughs> so um, the reason that we do this, of course, is that we want to ensure that when we're building plans for our students that have internalizing challenges, that we are thinking through our behavior support plans in this way where we're addressing setting events and immediate antecedents that occasion challenging behavior, and in this case, sometimes that occasion those private events. Um, identifying replacement behaviors to perform when anxiety or, and or intrusive thoughts are present for the student. Um, what can they do instead of either withdrawing or acting out? And then developing functional replacement, um, I'm sorry, reinforcement strategies for supporting contextually appropriate and adaptive behaviors. So when we think about defining behavior, this is always a, our first step when we're thinking about um, taking this function-based approach. So what is it that we're talking about? So what do we mean when we say a student is anxious or depressed? Or what do we mean when we say that a student is socially withdrawn? So obviously we're defining behaviors oftentimes by what we're seeing, but in the case of internalizing challenges, we're also thinking about what are we not seeing? So again, when we think about social withdrawal, how are we defining that for the student? Still, what does it look like? Um, and we do that by thinking about what does this look like in context? So for example, social withdrawal might look like sitting by oneself at lunch. Um, it might mean that during recess or during gym that students are choosing not to interact with their peers. It may mean even tracking how often students are responding to initiations from their peers or initiating socially to their peers. So of course, the first step after we define the challenge for students, uh, we have that challenging behavior where all you all on the same page talking about the same behavior um, as adults in the environment um, so that we know what we're tracking. We think about identifying antecedent events. So antecedent events, of course, are those events that occur immediately prior to behavior that occasion that responding from students. So this can be a little bit tricky when we're thinking about internalizing challenges because some of those internal states or thoughts that students are having or um, private events can be both the behavior that we want to change and can serve as triggers for additional negative or unhelpful thought patterns. But it's our job to try to do our very best to help the student connect those internal or private events and behaviors with triggers in the outside or external environment. So this can be basic things that we always think of in terms of triggers, in terms of particular settings, 
uh, routines, type of, of activities or assignments, um, interactions with particular adults. Um, but sometimes these triggers for students with internalizing challenges can be less straightforward. So things like unanticipated transitions or new adults entering the environment. If you think about students, for example, that have a history of trauma, sometimes we don't understand exactly why some of these associations do trigger um, either, again, withdrawal or acting out kinds of behaviors, but they do because of the learning history for this student. So these kinds of transi transitions can trigger a fear response. Other triggers can include things like being in close proximity or touch or even accidental touch from other students or adults, sounds and smells that have been um, associated with previous aversive events, or even really nuanced cues like tone of, tone of voice or nonverbal cues like cross arms or clenched fists. I know that when I, I work with all of my students now, because I, I think about this, but in learning how to work with students from really difficult places, if you will, really hard places, um, or students that have had traumatic um, histories. I always try to have my, my palms open or my, my fists um, relaxed um, and, and try to be really aware of my, of my tone of voice and my even my facial expressions because I don't want to um, occasion any type of, of fear response for those students. So, it can also be a bit challenging at times to think about the specific consequences that maintain internalizing behavior. Um, but we know that internalizing behavior is primarily maintained by avoidance or escape from a ple unpleasant events and can also, um, again, man manifest in those types of externalizing challenges that, again, are in, a, in an attempt to avoid or escape some of those unpleasant sensations um, that are occurring internally. So students may withdraw or act out um, in order or both in some cases in order to avoid things like um, internal states or feelings, like I said, feeling anxious, feeling fearful, obsessive or dysmorph dysmorphic or even upsetting thoughts that they're having, social dis disapproval, which can be real, such as in the case of bullying or can even be perceived. So maybe the student uh, avoids certain classes because they believe that the teacher um, doesn't like them, or they perceive that the teacher doesn't like them, or maybe there's a student in that classroom that they perceive as threatening in some way. Um, so whether or not that, that student actually is threatening, again, if that's the perception that the, that the this target student has, then, you know, that they're still going to act on that as if it is true. So in the book, Fostering Resilient Learners, uh, the authors provide examples of these fight, flight, or freeze responses or actions that are a result of real or perceived threat. So just take a moment to look at some of these behaviors. And as you're looking at them, think about, uh, do you notice any of these behaviors that you might not typically or immediately perceive as being the result of some sort of internalizing event or challenge? So when you think of a student who is, for example, repeatedly skipping class, do you consider that the student might be avoiding overwhelming feelings of inadequacy, for example? Um, so what about giving a blank look or refusing to, to give you a direct answer? Oftentimes we hear the word defiance. I hear um, the term ODD a lot. <laughs> and I always wonder, like, are we considering the fact that um, this could be a result of some potential um, possible trauma that has occurred in the past? Um, so when we think about this, I know that when I look at this list, it's, it's powerful for me because how might viewing challenging behavior from this lens change the way that we respond to and support students that are struggling? And how might it change the way that we show up for our students? If we're thinking about, you know, these things that can sometimes be, be very disruptive in our classrooms as actually being a result of some kind of, of internal challenge that a student is having. So for, um, when we're talking about sort of expanding our scope is the way I'm thinking about this. So when we're talking about FBA for internalizing behavior, um, we are always, like I said, we're always going to be thinking about those antecedents and identifying the behavior and the consequences. But sometimes we want to think about this in a little more 
in-depth way. Um, so, so in terms of precursor behaviors, that's something that we want to make sure that we're identifying when we're talking not only about defining the behavior of interest or the thing that we're concerned about, but also any of those behaviors that the student may be engaging in immediately prior to. So I'm, I'm thinking if, uh, you know, if a student, for example, who is um, who engages in elopement or who leaves the classroom without permission, are there things that that student typically does right before that occurs? So maybe we notice that the student becomes agitated or, or maybe the student um, looks, you know, spacey or they start to sort of to check out, if you will. So are there ways that we can basically catch it low and identify how to intervene before the, the student actually completely withdraws or leaves the environment? Are there other types of behaviors that we can catch before that that predictably occur beforehand? Um, we want to make sure that we're also thinking about what can under what conditions the student is successful and engaged. So in looking at the environmental, um, the environmental variables around that, so how does that compare to the context in which they're, they're having challenges or difficulties? What do their peer interactions look like? This is a big um, key that can help to let us know that the student may be having some internalizing challenges. How often are they interacting with peers? Um, how often are they, are they um, initiating to peers? How much time do they spend alone? So that comes to this next piece, which is, Sort of extracurricular activities and outside of, of school activities. So what does that look like for the student? Um, again, how much time are they spending alone versus with others? And how does the student respond to corrective feedback? So this can be another big piece. Um, Rose mentioned earlier talking about students that are overperforming or overachievers, perfectionists. Um, you know, how does a student take it when they are given any kind of academic feedback? I can um, from experience, when I think back to my own childhood, I had some pretty extreme responses to um, finding out that I didn't do something perfectly academically. So um, this one I can relate to. Um, also thinking about how we're using our screening data can be really important. So um, hopefully or optimally, we would be screening all of our students anyway to look for internalizing challenges as well as externalizing. Um, you'll see here there's a link and um, this is a freely available a screener for students. Even if this isn't something that you all are doing at your schools or on your campuses, um, you know, it's campus-wide to think about screening all students, at least as part of an FBA process, you know, thinking about having a relatively quick screener to add to your FBA interviewing process or your, um, you know, your records review process for students can be really helpful because you might be able to identify that some students, again, like I said earlier, that are engaging in externalizing challenges could also be experiencing internalizing behavior. So obviously we're looking at some different sources of information, or I'm sorry, some different types of information for our students. We're going to also want to include some different sources. So we want to make sure that we're thinking about parent interviews to, to identify how the student is doing at home, are they struggling at home and in the community, we might even interview some, some community resources. Um, we also wanna help identify those setting events, so things that are going on outside of school that can help us to predict challenging behavior in school. And then ways to increase that homeschool communication, because again, the more that we aren't able to see directly some of the behavior that is occurring or some of the challenges that a student is, is experiencing, the, that homeschool piece is going to become even more important. It's always important when we're, when we're, when we're working with students at tier three, but it becomes particularly important in this case. Also those direct observations across multiple contexts can be really important. So um, again, you know, thinking about those, those times in which the student is actually being successful. Oftentimes when we think about FBA, um, it, um, direct observations as part of an FBA, we think about identifying the, the time of the day or the context in which the challenging behavior is most likely to occur. And that's when we spend most of our time observing. In this case, we wanna get a better snapshot of how the student is doing across the day. So again, those peer initiations, we can even track how often are peers initiating, how often are, are um, the students, are, is the student responding to those initiations? How often is the student initiating to their peers? And again, like I said, those, um, those times when the student is doing well and is successful, let's track what does that look like for the student? 
you know, make sure that we understand that so that we can bring some of those components into the context in which they're having a challenge. And then, of course, I have here sort of bolded, if we're talking about behaviors that we are not privy to, of course, we need to talk to the student. <laughs> so we're going to need to interview the student and talk to them um, about things and how this looks from their perspective, what it is that they're experiencing. And then consider enlisting the support of a trusted adult if you are someone coming in to do the assessment that doesn't know the student particularly well. Definitely ask the student, who would you like to be here with you? You know, is there someone else that, that we could have with us that would make you feel comfortable or safe? Um, and or even having a mental health professional uh, there when you're doing that type of interview. So some additional members of the FBA VIP team for internalizing challenges. Um, we need our, of course, we need our administrator, our family members, school staff, and the student, um, but also thinking about someone that has advanced behavioral expertise, such as a VCBA, school psychologist, a mental health professional needs to be on the team, um, direct uh, personnel with access to external support agencies. So maybe bringing in someone from the community or having community resources um, for thinking about planning in those non-school-based context. So this is usually going to, um, is going to require some kind of wraparound support. So we want to think about those non-school contexts. And then, like I said, just like with the interview process, having a trusted adult. So not only including the student, but ensuring that the student has someone on the team um, who they feel is, is safe for them. So that's a person that they select the, themselves, perhaps. So in thinking through behavior support planning, of course, the whole reason that we conduct FBA is so that we can provide support for students that is directly tailored to their needs at tier three. So when we're thinking about prevention and teaching new skills and reinforcement, we always wanna think about what is the function of the behavior for this student. And you can move on, uh, Rose, thank you. So I'm just going to go through a few general types of antecedent um, and teaching and, and reinforcement strategies really quickly here. Uh, Rose is going to go into a lot more detail, and I'm keeping track of my time, Rose, because I'm going to make sure I don't cut into your time to talk about all these important pieces. So for antecedent strategies, when we are focused on internalizing challenges, one of the things that we want to make sure that we're doing is enhancing predictability and supporting regulation for these students. So one of the things that we might consider doing is providing an individualized copy of the daily schedule. Again, just building in that predictability. Consider for some students adding the people that will be involved in that activity. Sometimes for students with internalizing challenges, like I mentioned earlier, having a, a, a different adult or even sometimes different students enter the environment can be triggering. So letting them know when they can expect that. Um, scheduling self-check-ins throughout the day. So when you know, having actual prompts for students to check in with themselves, including time in the schedule for regulation um, strategies, like a walk and talk with a trusted adult, allowing some extra space for students, like I said, to, to um, limit the amount of, of contact for students who don't want to be too close to other students. So thinking about space around their desk, during times when they're lining up or in the hallways um, or in the cafeteria. That might also include strategic seating arrangements in terms of space, but also for some students, having them in a space where they feel close to the door can be really important. Again, that um, if I have anxiety about being trapped, you know, being close to an exit, having a cool down area that they can get to quickly, having a space that's away from distractions or extra stimulation may, may be helpful. And then advance notice or prompt before transitions can be um, very helpful. And that's a, an evidence-based strategy um, for students with anxiety. But particularly when we're thinking about um, difficult transitions, so we know, hopefully we know our students, and by this process, we'll know our students well enough to know what is going to be difficult for them so we can anticipate that and make sure that we're providing some of that advance notice before they move to, move to those new spaces. So for teaching strategies, so I need to check on my notes here. <laughs> Got multiple things going on. So for teaching strategies in terms of replacement behavior, um, we know that replacement behavior serve the same function as the challenging behavior. Um, and we want to teach the student a way to communicate their needs. So that's what we're trying to do by teaching this 
this um, replacement skill. However, when we're talking about internalizing challenges. Sometimes part of teaching students to communicate their needs is also um, teaching them to recognize their needs. So in this case, we may want to teach self-regulation routines. So teaching the student to recognize and manage their own anxiety by identifying those physical states, helping them to, to feel what, what do I start to experience when I'm, when I'm getting anxious, having some thought interruptions. So this can be helpful for both anxiety and depression, but replacing negative thoughts with positive replacement thoughts. And, and that's a skill that has to be taught, of course. Some exec and executive functioning strategies for impulsivity. So teaching students how to, um, when before they act to really think um, and even have a process for thinking through how they're going to, to respond. And then of course, some strategies for this calming response. So focused breathing, ways to appropriately ask for taking a break, um, moving to another space at times to regulate as opposed to, to becoming dysregulated. And then of course, we also want to teach those desired skills. So we were just talking about some replacement skills, but we also wanna teach those long-term desired skills that we're looking for as, as um, longer-term outcomes. So we might want to focus on um, some participation in skills-based groups for identifying um, thoughts and feelings in real time, identifying the feeling of a perceived threat. Again, for students with anxiety, our bodies um, react as if there is a threat in the environment in terms of our, our um, hormone and, and cortisol levels and, and the way that, that we feel um, and have respondent reactions can look and feel as if there's a threat in the environment. So learning to identify that and learning how to have some soothing or self-soothing strategies. And skills for forming and strengthening relationships with adults and peers can also be really helpful for students with anxiety and depression, of course. Um, and then self-management strategies. Uh, again, when we're thinking about students with internalizing challenges, sometimes we're not privy to what's going on. So teaching them how to identify and manage their own thoughts and feelings can be a really important part of this for students, of, of building these sort of social, emotional, behavioral competencies. And speaking of this, I just wanted to point out again, because this, I think that self-management is really key for students with internalizing challenges. So we often think of self-management as it relates to things like work completion or on-task behavior or attending to instruction. But what, for some students, we also might want to think about teaching them how to self-manage things like positive self-talk or their physiological state, use of regulation strategies, and those kinds of initiations to peers and adults. So even tracking their own behavior and doing some of that self-recruitment of reinforcement when they're able to do that. And then finally, we're, we're talking about obviously reinforcement, uh, reinforcing those behaviors that we want to see more of. So strategies for reinforcement um, are going to include those strategies for reinforcing the use of replacement and desired behaviors. So we're thinking about the replacement behavior. Of course, we want to immediately honor that new behavior. So for example, if the student requests a break, then of course we want to acknowledge and um, honor that request in the moment. But we also wanna make sure that we're reinforcing the new skills that we're teaching um, for self-regulation and participating and interacting with peers. And I have a note here about a word about escape as a reward. I think this is really important because again, we do want to honor um, those requests for escape when needed, but we wanna make sure that there's a very dense schedule of reinforcement in place for those new desired skills, because eventually we want the student to come into contact with a lot of positives in those environments that do or have in the past occasioned some of this anxiety or these feelings because we want them to be successful in those environments. And we don't want the long-term outcome to be that they just know how to escape these environments appropriately. We want them to be able to, to thrive in those environments. Okay, Rose, I'm handing it back to you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Great. I'm going to talk a little bit about cognitive behavior therapy because this is one of the interventions that has pretty substantial research um, showing the effectiveness of addressing the symptoms of students with anxiety. So this is one of those evidence-based practices. 
And for those of you who may not be as familiar with this, uh, what CBT does, and I love it, um, Kathleen already set the stage for us understanding CBT. Um, and here it's kind of, it looks almost like, you know, the ABCs of behavioral, applied behavioral analysis. But it, typically what happens with the CBT model is something happens, there's a trigger. So a teacher tells the student to stop talking and start his work. The student has a thought. This is an internal thought. Now, the thought may not be accurate, but this is the perception of the student. The student thinks, she always picks on me. Lots of other kids are talking too. This thought becomes an emotion. The student feels on a scale of one to 10 for anger. The student starts getting angry about what the teacher, this thought that the teacher doesn't like him, sort of like Kathleen already talked about. This is the focus of cognitive therapy, is trying to replace those thoughts with more accurate perceptions or more positive thoughts. The focus of the behavior part of cognitive behavior therapy then is on the actual manifestation of the behavior that results from it. The student says, what, why are you picking on me? Don't you see that Riley is talking to? Why don't you say something to him? So this would be an example for anger-based CBT. We're going to talk a little bit about anxiety CBT. So one of the things you want to think about for CBT is, is CBT appropriate for your individual student? And they do have to have the cognitive and communicative skills to at least talk about thoughts and behaviors. So I work a lot with students with autism and do a lot of research with autism. And there are a few studies that have looked at some things like coping cat, I'm gonna talk a little bit about using that with students with high functioning autism. So there are ways to do this with some kids who might have not the most intact um, ways to reflect upon their performance and evaluate their own performance. But you, they do have to be able to think about their behaviors and understand their thought process. They also have to be able to generalize from individual interventions to the point of intervention. So often CBT in the past has been done through a series of, um, for example, there's lessons or there's sessions with CBT. And one session might be, let's start, as Kathleen said, let's start talking about where in your body you start feeling anxiety. And so you, I have to be able to identify, I know when I'm starting to become anxious because if I understand the behaviors that are telling me I'm getting sweaty palms, that means I'm starting, I'm going to get anxious, or I'm going to get a panic attack, or I'm going to start um, avoiding these situations or start asking to go to the nurse because I'm starting to get these anxious behaviors and feelings. They have to be able to generalize from those little lessons that we're doing and working with them on individually to then actually when it happens at the point of intervention. They also have to be open to talking about their thoughts. Um, so if they're reluctant to do that, we might have to work on that. And they, it's very goal oriented, as Kathleen is saying, setting the goals um, it's, are very effective. Cognitive behavior therapy requires our um, students to have some goals on what they're going, how they're going to perform, how they're going to behave as a result of having these um, treatments given. So we do CBT in schools because it's very evidence-based. Um, if you get the, the most bang out of the buck for this, because we could provide this intervention, at least within the context in which the students are experiencing the, some of their anxiety. And in some cases, when we talk about that generalization, if we provide a lot more support and training on um, the CBT strategies that are being taught to the student, like the teacher knows the uh, strategies as well, the teacher can prompt the student, are you feeling anxious now? What are the behaviors that you're feeling? Where in your body are you feeling it? And start prompting them to the point of intervention to use um, those strategies, as opposed to a student going to an outside therapist or uh, a counselor outside of the classroom. Um, we can help with that generalization hump. It can also give more consistent and widespread care to students because again, that uh, original slide I have where we have a lot of treatment barriers for mental health needs. And if we can cut off the treatment barriers by actually giving them a consistent program, um, delivering an intervention of regular and consistently so that the student can get access to it. And if we do it in schools, it's definitely more affordable than outside agencies. Um, we do have some barriers with CBT. There's a lot of different CBT strategies. So sometimes um, you have to understand CBT enough to know which CBTs are best used for situations. 
who can deliver CBT. There's no credentialing process. Uh, a lot of school psychologists get training in CBT. So do social workers. So there are people who may already come prepared to help support others to learn CBT. Um, universal approaches and um, knowing how to just some general things to do and then some of the prevention things that we do in CBT to help prevent the student from getting to the escalated anxiety states uh, are best for teachers to learn to do. Training sometimes if you invest in some of these specific CBT programs can be a bit resource heavy because there's a lot of sessions or it may cost a lot to get some of the training. I'm going to tell you about one thing that's easy, though, that everybody knows about uh, that I think is not very time intensive to learn. So one of the most frequently used CBT strategies for anxiety or fears is exposure therapy. Um, I'm not going to go because I'm looking at our time. We want to leave. Um, about 10 minutes at least for questions. And I have a lot to cover, like two examples of plans. So I want to get to those. Um, so the process of, a, of facing the fears is one of the things that's used most often. Um, and if you go to this website and if you pull up the PowerPoint presentation that um, I made sure the this resource does work, this, this is the right um, link you will get to this wonderful site in which they have all these free downloadable resources. They have Facing Your Fears Exposure. It's a handout that actually explains step-by-step step how to do exposure. And then the handout, The Fear Ladder, which is most often used when you do um, fear exposure. So uh, fear exposure is trying to get for example, if you're afraid of heights, which is the most a common thing among people, what we typically do in order to get over that fear or to avoid places that are high up, which is the most uh, the coping strategy of most people who are afraid of heights, we start addressing how to get more practice um, gradually so that we can know we no longer avoid this situation, no longer feel anxious um, when we are in a situation which we're at very high up. And so a fear ladder helps you identify what are the things that you're afraid of about heights, like looking at pictures of that are taken from high up might be one person's uh, fear. And then actually being on a step ladder or um, being in a plane or um, going up an elevator or being in a balcony. I mean, then you can list all these kind of things. And then the fear ladder organizes around what's the least scary to the most scary and where treatment begins and the exposure begins is the least scary and then you build it up. So if you would go to that um, site, you're gonna be able to see tons of um, interventions, tons of downloadable resources that you can use. And they, uh, I love their step-by-step -step instructions on how to do things. This is just an example. Bruce Chirpedo, by the way, I have the graphic over the date. Um, and if you want to know more about Bruce Chirpedo, um, you can email me. Uh, he does have this match ADTC and he sells um, a, not very expensive. It's a yearly fee to be able to have access to some of his modules on matching resources and CBT therapies with different cases and especially have anxiety. So he has a fear ladder as well. These are some just some examples. You have these. So I'm going to keep on going. One specific strategy that we do know um, works for students who are anxious is called Coping Cat. Some of you may be aware of Coping Cat. This is just the picture of the manual. You can see it's kind of old because the manual is not very colorful or everything. And that's a picture of the, um, the, the um, hard copy of the manual. But they do have stuff online as well. So uh, when Kathleen was talking about identifying where in your body you feel fear, this is the first one of the first lessons of coping cat is having the child identify where in their body they start feeling anxious. And then this is one for um, older students. So there's one for young students, one for older students now. And it's um, the one for young students really cute because they have a bigger picture of the body and they get to go in and color in their body parts where they feel anxious in their first lesson. And they have a, what's called a fear pyramid instead of a ladder. So I wanted to see, that was a very quick and dirty and not anywhere where it needs to be for CBT. Um, I have two more polls. One, the poll is, are you familiar with CBT? And it's just a yes or a no. So if you could just go to that poll and let me know if you're familiar with it. I, and this is for my own um, knowledge, just 
because I know that often CBT is not something that is well known by a lot of school people. I'm gonna see if we're different here. And Brian, if you see any results coming in yet. Okay, yep, yeah, just getting to that right now. And then you can go on to the next one as well. Once you finish that poll, it, are there other people in your school and district who are familiar with CBT? And it's still, it's still poll, not a chat box. Yes, no, I'm not so sure. Rose, we do have some votes now on those okay. who are familiar with CBT and we're, say, we're seeing 80% yes. <sighs> so happy it's increasing i think or we have the right people here yeah and then as far as are there people in your school or district who are familiar about 42 percent are saying yes but a 51 percent are saying not sure okay well that would make sense i would love i'm one of my dreams is to be able to see cbt more widely um implement it and being more familiar with more people because if you have and we have a lot of students with anxiety and COVID has not helped one bit um so we're going to see more kids with anxiety uh i i think that would be a great professional development to invest in is to consider how to get staff more familiar with cbt and it doesn't have to be all at the tense level where they actually need to be people who can provide the interventions but maybe just awareness or some people just need to be familiar enough with it to understand when they have a child who is receiving cbt that they understand it enough that they can implement some of the strategies from on the plans so i'm going to show you a couple of examples um, uh, this is an example of an anxiety kid this is ben so ben has a setting event we did an fba for ben um and i'm i'm using these trainings i go through the entire here's how we identify the do step one two three four but i'm just going straight to the plan this time because we don't have enough time so this is his hypothesis uh, hypothesis and these are the interventions that they did so when ben's parents are out of town and Ben stays with another adult and then he goes to school and he's asked to do the tasks he doesn't like to do that are really long um, or it, when he's required to take a test, he puts his head down on his desk. So that's the that's his manifestation. And I remember Kathleen talked about what you don't see. He's not participating in the exam. He's not disruptive to the point where he's bothering other people, but he's he's withdrawing from it. As a result, he gets to escape that non-preferred task and secondarily gets a touch of the teacher because the teacher goes over and she knows he's anxious and tries to soothe him and all um, and get him to take the test. So the prevention intervention is first they did a setting event modification to know when um, a communication system for when Ben's parents are out of town. They're going to be notified. Um, of those days ahead of time so that on the days that Ben's parents are out of town, this condition will be present. He's gonna be provided with choices when, when the non-preferred tasks are happening, including choosing the amount he'll do, choosing if he'll do some of it now or later, or if the teacher observes that Ben's anxiety is high, she's gonna allow him to choose to do the assignment or go to the counselor for 10 minutes to talk or do um, some cognitive behavior therapy lesson. Now, when we talk about the replacement behavior, same thing. Now we're going to replace the putting his head down. Um, he, we're going to teach him to first, like, like um, we said, Kathleen said, we're going to teach him to ask for an escape. He can select from break passes that indicate different times, 5, 10, 15 minutes, or a fourth option, ask to see the counselor to get some um, CBI support. We also, when she talked about um, really enriching reinforcement and for a, the alternative strategy that we want to teach Ben, because he has to take tests eventually, he has to do these tasks. What can we teach him? Can there an anxiety reducing strategy that will allow him to overcome those feelings of anxiety? Because a lot of the anxiety and fear is more about, you know, the fear of what's going to happen than it's actually going to happen. And so your body is... Um, kind of releasing all these feelings that are very distressing. And so we can re give him some stress relievers or teach him some things and also CBT will give him some coping mechanisms. Reinforcement, how is he gonna get escape? Every time he uses a break pass, he gets a break from the task for the requested amount of time. Every time he uses an anxiety reduction strategy, he's gonna get some reduction naturally of his anxiety, which will be a natural reinforcement. And then we'll also get positive praise and comments and a little bit of time away because he's going to do this, pre um, this, this coping strategy and he'll get to earn later on to do a um, more, pro more preferred task. 
Okay, that was real quick and dirty. I'm so sorry. It's uh, hard to do, uh, challenging to do things in one hour sometimes. Okay, school refusal. I want to talk specifically about this because we've noticed an increase with COVID in school refusal behavior. Um, the first thing is, what is school refusal behavior? It comes under a lot of different terms, non-attended, school refusal, school phobia, or truancy. What it basically is, it's child-motivated refusal to attend school or difficulties remaining in class all day. And it can be a combination of those. And I was supposed to enter here. So it's um, typo there. They could be include students who are completely absent from school or classes or plead to not attend. So kids who do go, but they, for the families, it is a chore to get them on the bus or get them ready for the bus or get them in the car or get them out of the car uh, into the school building, display physical refusal and tardiness at home to avoid the school. Um, so these are kids who might actually start manifesting some externalizing behaviors and um, display elevated distress during school leading to future non-attendance. So they, these are some of the kids who also might go to the nurse a lot, the somatic complaints. Um, and school refusal, I'm going to probably now skip because we uh, we want to leave 10 minutes so I could start <laughs> skipping some things so if I talk too fast please forgive me uh, we do know that we need to do school refusal because um, it really is correlated to poor long-term outcomes um, kids are missing school they're not going to get academics right their mental health also is um, impacted because they're not now ha having the social interactions. They're going to be more anxious because they're going to worry about how do we catch up on our um, work. Our work's going to get so far behind. Why do we even bother going to school? Um, this also impacts when they graduate. Their um, prognosis in life is a little bit more negative than those who don't do school refusal behaviors. We also see that for those of you who work with children with special needs, um, students who have autism have higher rates of school refusal behaviors compared to general child and adolescent rates. So, so 40 to 53% of students with ASD um, commonly have some school refusal behaviors in some phase in their life compared to five to 28% in general ed adolescent populations. These are some of the contributing factors. Um, I point out what, what some of the things that we work a lot on PBIS, being bullied or teased. Um, sometimes those transitions again, um, family characters and think about all of the stuff that's been going on with COVID. And I'll put a little bit of what's happening with COVID with um, school refusal and then just some of the child and youth characteristics. The pandemics had a big impact on school refusal behavior. Um, in 2021, it was, it's estimated that 3 million students have, are absent from or not actively participating in a remote learning. And I know with um, going back to um, on-site campuses that a lot of kids are getting lost. They're not coming to school. It's uh, really hard to find them and get them back to school. And these are some of the characteristics of students who seem to be um, having more school refusal behaviors. So again, consider that um, we have some cultural, ethnic, and other conditions that are really impacting some students more so than others. I have a colleague in Australia, Melbourne, who has a clinic actually, and was working on school refusal and trying to um, re reduce it. And she had a workshop last year during COVID, and she was talking to me about um, how and she surveyed 400 parents and educators. She said that COVID resulted in increased in school absenteeism, remote learning during lockdown, exacerbated students who were at risk in the first place of having school attendance problems. And one interesting thing that um, also I attended a training at uh, our webinar sponsored by the Institute of Education Sciences the other day, there are students who did well in virtual learning. They actually thrived. These are students now who don't want to go back to school. They don't see a reason. A lot of those kids are students who have autism, who don't see a reason to have social um, interactions. So they're saying, why go back to school? Um, and schools that had the schools that engage in maintaining relationships during remote learning, we're seeing better school attendance. So keeping that connection. So I'm not going to go into this because we only have four minutes left before we open up for questions. Um, there is a 
you, uh, Department of Ed handbook that I um, was bad and did not put the link for it here. But I know if you Google it, if you're not familiar, all of you may be familiar with it. They do have some things to address school refusal behaviors, especially based on, on COVID. And we're not going to do the discussion, but think about this for putting questions in now for Kathleen and I to answer the last 10 minutes of this session. Think about what might be happening with school um, with factors that are impacting either anxiety, um, school refusal behaviors, and how might um, what are some of those conditions that are impacting them and how might they be impacting. So all the things that Kathleen said about functional thinking for anxiety internalizing behaviors, we do the exact same thing for school refusal. Um, Kearney has actually done um, several studies, single subject design on school refusal behaviors, and he has a school refusal scale, just got to tell you that. Um, so you want to do if you want to learn a little bit more about this, this is a snapshot of his school refusal scale. So this could be kind of like a, um, a rating scale that you could add to your repertoire of FBA interviews as well as, because um, you can't observe school refusal sometimes because they're at home. So you have to kind of do mostly indirect methods um, for, to figure out the school refusal. Um, the other thing is we do want to think functionally about school refusal behaviors because if we can do function link strategies that are feasibly implemented in schools or at home. And one of the things that you have to think about is when we do um, do functional behaviors, this with school refusal behavior and think about it is mainly due to anxiety and avoidance of school. Um, there's also a, a function that is not due to anxiety. It's those students who don't see any reason to come to school because there's nothing positive about school and they have more reinforcement staying home or they can watch TV all day, they can stream, they can go out and see their friends. There's a lot of external reinforcers that are more reinforcing to school. So you wanna sort that out and what CBT um, strategies are not good for that one, but CBTs are great for those kids who are refusing school due to anxiety. Uh, one of the things you want to think about is um, how you're going to partner with the parent, because if they're refusing to come to school, you can't get around it. Your intervention is going to have to involve the parent and pretty extensively because that parent will have to do an intervention to get to with you to help get that child to school. So it's a partnership. So these are some strategies that we do for school refusal assessment when it's based on anxiety. Um, anxiety, it would be we can do CBT relaxation. Um, for versus social situations, we might have peer supporter modeling. Um, and there's some CBT um, to increase social skills. We can do behavioral therapies for shaping and differential reinforcement of the alternative behavior we want to see. If it's because they like to stay home and not even come to school, they're not anxious, they just don't like school, we might do some con contingency contracting. And with uh, one minute left, you will get to read later about Emma, who um, came through our clinic. And I have a clinic at uh, the university where we do um, evaluations, interventions, and we collaborate with school districts to help um, support the students they refer to us for success. And Emma, um, this year in Florida, la last year in Florida, we actually didn't, we, we had brick and mortar school as well as hybrid, but she refused to attend brick and mortar school. Here were the behaviors, there were many somatic complaints like migraines. Um, this is the functional assessment, the um, outcomes that we got from the functional assessment. This was her hypothesis. I'm really running through this because we're out of time. And these are just to have some of our interventions that we did. So replacement behaviors that we decided to, to teach her, reinforcement for these and change the response to the reports of migraine is what we did mostly. This is an example of the collaboration we did with her family for attending school rewards. So I gave you her little chart. Um, we also taught her to do CBT relaxation, progressive muscle relaxation, especially because she was complaining of migraine headaches. And this is an example of, um, can't, can't remember where we got this, but this is um, how, what we taught her to do to have really deep breathing and progressive muscle relaxation, which is evidence-based. 
Um, and then here are our data. Uh, so we, her, she reduced her number of migraines. She started increasing her attendance at school um, and everybody found the intervention acceptable. We have a social validity. We try to give that to most of our parents and our um, teachers. So I'm so sorry I um, ran through that. We put too much in this, this brief presentation. So we, um, before we do the evaluation and open up for questions, um, you, we do have our email in here. If you have personal questions you want to ask afterwards, just email us. Uh, we do have recommended readings. And right now we'll just take questions for nine minutes. So Brian? Yeah, Rose. So uh, for you and Kathleen, then just looking at the chat here, a couple of questions have started to come in here towards the end. Um, some folks are interested to know more about uh, screening and progress monitoring for you know, students who may benefit from CBT. Um, and then there's another question here asking about the coping cat as a resource and what other tools or resources you might utilize for CBT within the schools. So those are all great questions. Um, I know that if the one place that you could probably get a lot of information is that um, anxiety website which is in Canada, which has a lot of resources. It not only has like the fear ladder and how to do the fear ladder, it has um, resources for parents. It has resources for teachers. It has resources for students. I'm looking at some of them, I have, um, I'm, I have another computer and I have it opened up. So they have like how, um, some things like how to documents, how to teach your child calm breathing, how to help your child sleep alone or away from home. Um, what to do if you're anxious or worry about COVID-19? How do you talk to kids about COVID-19? All of those are free. For um, more professional development, and you're an educator and you wanna get more thinking about, well, I wanna learn a lot more about CBT. I would highly recommend looking at Bruce Chorpita's resources. Um, Chorpita's last name is spelled C-H-O-R-P-I-T-O, -O, first name Bruce. He has Match ADTC, a nice book that goes through. What I like about that book, it is very useful for teachers and practitioners because he goes through um, like his appendix with all examples of how to do cognitive behavior therapy, how you match the needs of that student with the appropriate CBT strategy. So I would highly recommend you, you look at that. And if you have any trouble, just email me and I can um, send you the, the link. I wish I would have put it in the readings. I forgot all about that. The other thing he has that you might consider your school um, or if you have professional development money is he has an online program called Match ADTC, um, which I can send people um, the link to it's, it's, it does cost money, but it has the whole program in there where you can, you, you can go through and get all of the flow charts and the screening measures and the um, kind of the identification measures to help identify exactly what CBT strategy is matched to that student's need. And I think it's only something like $100 a year. So that might be something your, your school would be um, okay to invest, uh, invest in or district. And I don't know how many people can share the same um, link. I know I shared my personal one with one other person and we didn't get caught. So I think, I'm thinking that maybe you can share it with at least one other person without them saying something. Uh, but that might be something to ask Ask um, that. For, for a coping cat, is that, was there a question about coping cat? Uh, well, you had mentioned coping cat in the presentation and the... Um the chat that was referencing that was asking if there were other kinds of resources that you might use to um, provide CBT yeah. in the schools. Yeah, and I would say that I answered that with the first bunch of answers I gave cool. in a, a really fast. I don't know, Kathleen, what about you? Do you have anything to add to that? Kathleen, you are mute, maybe you're... Oh, she may not be able to unmute Rose. I think uh, there's, she might be having some technical issues there. Oh, okay. I'm seeing a message here for her. Okay, um, that's okay. I, we'll go ahead. Um, there is a question here that came in. First of all, maybe a couple of first quick questions. For, uh, if you happen to know the author of the school refusal assessment scale. Yeah, that's Kearney, K-E-A-R. Let me go back to that slide. Yeah, 
I know when I go too fast, then what happens is, and you do have these, the, this PowerPoint in the, um, there it is, whoops, go back, 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 back. Okay, it is K-E-A-R-N-E-Y. It is free, actually. Um, if you put in Google School Refusal Assessment Scale Revised, you will get hits and you'll get some PDFs. And then you can just download. There's a parent version, there's a child version. Cool. And I get the complete version. There's one that has both versions and also has the um, instructions on, on how to score it. It's kind of like, um, I don't know if you remember the old when we used to do FBA BIPs and we used the motivation assessment scale that Mark Duran did and Brian Awada's FAST. Um, it's, it's probably not sufficient to stand in and of itself because what it does is depending on the answers to the questions, depending how many like combination like if you answer like always or almost always for one four ten and eleven and you answer this for these four you're going to get different functions because um each of these questions tries to get at a different function but it might give you a good starting point i think these scales are really good to figure out what kind of questions you might want to ask in an interview because you have to modify interviews to talk about more about what are some conditions present in which um your child will have these score refusal behaviors like as a test. Um, is it because of uh, social situation? And I really, this probably doesn't even, this is outdated. I think they need to put social media on this now and bullying from social media because I know of, uh, 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 personally of a lot of kids who stay home from school because of what's going on with social media. And there's some, they're anxious. They don't wanna have um, the other students like like saying stuff to them or bullying them or saying mean things or continuing to bully them on on social media so consider that that's something that within the past few years has become a very anxiety provoking and can lead to not only anxious anxiety and depression um but kids refusing to go to school because they don't want to face the other kids All right, so we've got about a minute and a half left. Um, not sure if you wanna take this question on, but someone was asking how much data do you think you would need to collect before you conduct your FBA? Oh, what a wonderful question. I, it depends. Um, there, there are some cases that just by asking a few questions um, and maybe having um, a couple of days of data where you can see a pattern, um, you have enough data. I would not delay treatment, delay interventions to get X number of days of intervention. I mean, when you think about what we our, our standard for single subject designs, we sometimes just say we want to see three data points or we want to establish a pattern of um, where we see a pattern that's a stable pattern. Sometimes that's impossible to get. But if you have enough data showing you that this behavior is a problem, then I wouldn't say don't get more baseline data. And you can do some of your functional behavior assessment while concurrently collecting data. So you can identify, because you're going to first identify that behavior. You're going to define it. Um, and our, our specific functional behavior assessment method that we train called Prevent, Teach, Reinforce, we usually uh, get um, baseline data for about a week in between the first meeting where we identify the behavior in the second meeting when we agree upon the hypothesis and start developing the plan. I um, know that teachers often tell me that they, it takes them months sometimes before they actually get to the plan because they're asked to take so much data before a plan is um, even thought about. And then by that time, they're like, I don't even want the kid in my classroom anymore. All right. Well, Rose, that brings us to the end of our time. Thank you so much. And thank you, Kathleen. So sorry for the tech issues there. At yeah, the end. and I, don't, I, I have no idea how to unmute her. I thought I'd have the, um, the power, but I, it just says ask to unmute. So who knows? I know that we have, whoops. There, let me put this back. So we need your evaluation. So there is our evaluation. Thing. Thank you all so much. Thank you for um, putting up with fast talking. And if you look at the PowerPoint and you have any questions on 
any of the plans that we describe, please feel free to um, email us. And if you want copies of things, you can't find things, email me. Okay. <laughs> 